Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and in this video series, we have been talking all about the Melchizedekian Pesach. And the Melchizedekian Pesach is the Passover that we keep when we're under Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order. And in the very first chapter of this series, we took a look at what the Apostle Shaul really meant in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. If you haven't seen that chapter, I encourage you to watch it now because we're going to be talking about it all through this video and also through the next one. But in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we saw that what the Apostle Shell was telling us was not to let any man but the body of Messiah therefore tell us what to do with regards to the ritual meat offerings or food offerings that we eat, the ritual drink offerings that we drink, or in respect to a feast day or of a new moon day, or of the Sabbath, because these are all prophetic shadow pictures of things and events still to come. It's very important that we keep those rituals the way we're supposed to keep them, but we also saw that the rituals can change a little bit, depending upon whether we're in the land or outside the land, and also what priesthood we have. Now, in the original Pesach, when Israel was first leaving Egypt, in Exodus chapter 12, there was no priesthood in Israel. That's why the original Pesach ritual in Exodus 12 called for the heads of the houses, meaning the men, to offer the Pasha lambs within their own gates. And they also placed the blood upon their own doorposts. And the reason they did this is because there was no standing priesthood. Now this would change after Israel left Egypt. After Israel received a priesthood, that would all be different. But for the original Pesach ritual, we saw in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11, Israel was supposed to eat the Pesach with a belt on their waist, their shoes on their feet, and their staves in their hand, basically ready for action, ready to leave the land of Egypt. And Yahweh told them to eat it in haste. And that's because the first Pesach was a rehearsal for leaving Egypt and relocating back to the land of Israel. Bear that thought in mind. We're going to see it again throughout this presentation and also again next week. We also saw in last week's section on the Levitical Pesach that there's certain commandments that apply when we live in the land. So in Deuteronomy or Devarim chapter 12 and verse 1, Yahweh begins a long monologue telling Israel what are the special things that they're supposed to do when they live in the land of Israel. And these things were to apply to them all the days that they were to live on the soil. Again, meaning in the land of Israel. Four chapters later, Yahweh's still giving Israel these special rules. And in Devarim, or Deuteronomy 16 and verse 2, he says, You shall therefore sacrifice the Pesach unto Yahweh your Elohim of the flock and of the herd in the place which Yahweh shall choose to place his name there. So, when Israel lives in the land, typically speaking, there's going to be a Levitical priesthood. Because when Israel was all together in the wilderness, they traveled all together, there wasn't a special need to unite them three times a year because they were already together. But when they entered the land of Israel, they spread out, and therefore there was a need for a Levitical priesthood with a cleansed Levitical altar so that the nation of Israel could unify around the rituals at the cleansed Levitical altar three times a year. But what happened in the first century? That's what we're going to talk about in this episode. So in Yeshua's time, meaning in the first century, in the second temple period, Israel was already living in the land of Israel. They weren't going anywhere suddenly. They weren't leaving Egypt quickly. So did Israel really need to eat the Pesach standing, feasting in haste, so to speak, in order to rehearse leaving Egypt in haste? Now, just as a question, and I'm not advocating this, we're going to talk about this at the end of the presentation. Is it possible that Israel could perhaps eat the Pesach sitting or perhaps lying down, reclining, to rehearse dwelling in the land? Now, remember, I'm not advocating this. We'll talk more about this at the end of this presentation. But in order to understand what happened in the first century and to understand these events in context, we need to realize that the Renewed Covenant was not written by Gentiles, and it also was not written in a vacuum. Yeshua and his disciples were all raised as Second Temple Period Jews, and they practiced what could be called Second Temple Period Judaism. 
Now, it's important to understand the differences because even though Yeshua soundly rebuked and rejected the rabbinical customs and traditions that went against his father's Torah, yet he and his disciples still kept many of the general Second Temple Jewish customs and traditions that did not contradict his father's Torah. And that's just simply because that was the culture that they grew up in. So we need to understand the Second Temple period culture that Yeshua and his disciples grew up in so we can understand what needs to be rejected and what needs to be maintained. Now we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Today our Orthodox brothers and sisters keep the Passover with what is called a traditional Jewish Passover Seder service. Now, the exact origins of the Passover Seder are not known. It's believed that it may have originated in the second century or so. And because the Jews are very traditional people, what they like to do is they like to form their customs and traditions around modifications of what they believe their ancestors did in earlier times. Now, just between us, uh, the Jewish, with respect, I say that the Jewish customs and traditions tend to drift over times, but they like to at least pretend that they're doing exactly what their ancestors did. And we'll see how, why that's important later on. But what we see is that today's Passover Seder service may derive from customs and traditions that were practiced in the first century, in Yeshua's time during the Second Temple period. So we may see that Yeshua ate the Last Supper as a Passover Seder. But does that necessarily mean that we should do the same thing today? Or, just asking the question, is it possible that there are other factors to consider which mean that we should not eat the Pesach as a Passover Seder meal today? We're going to talk about all these questions and more in this episode where we talk all about the Last Supper. Stay with us. Now, I want to be very respectful about this because while we in the nation of Ephraim were off in the nations and we were serving idols and we were feeding the pigs, so to speak, our Jewish brothers and sisters were at least attempting to keep the commandments of Yahweh. Now, there have been some very serious deviations in their observances, how they keep the commandments of Yahweh, and these deviations are not small and they're not innocuous. There's some very real problems with the way that they do things. But at least our Jewish brothers and sisters have attempted to keep the commandments of Yahweh. And one of the things that they have done is they have come up with what they call the rabbinical Passover Seder service. And this is their attempt to keep the Pesach now that they're no longer in Egypt. And so one of the things that we see that they do is they do not stand. They also don't eat hastily. Uh, they don't have staves in their hands and they're not preparing to flee Egypt. But rather what they're doing is they're sitting down at a table and they're eating the Pesach in a very relaxed, leisurely fashion. And they're doing this no matter where they are. They could be inside the land of Israel, outside the land of Israel. They could be in the land of Egypt for that matter. It doesn't matter. They're going to be sitting down at a table having a very relaxed, leisurely meal. That's also scripted and stylized and looks very, very different from the Exodus chapter 12 service. So the Passover Seder is this scripted, stylized meal, and it involves taking four cups of wine. It also inv uh, involves eating from various bowls of dip or sop. And they typically, again, they sit, or in ancient times they laid, so they were either sitting or reclining, and that's how they went about things. So you read the rabbinic writings, and you talk with the rabbis about why do they hold the Pesach Seder the way that they do. And typically speaking, what you'll read or what you will hear is that in the ancient Middle East, slaves typically stood to wait on their masters as they ate. And so since the Israelites were slaves, probably many of them stood to wait on their masters. And since the Jews are no longer in slavery, now the Jews believe that they should sit or lean or perhaps in ancient times they would recline at the Pesach table to again to celebrate their freedom from slavery and bondage. And that all sounds very good, but the problem is that wasn't the reason Israel stood in Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, Israel stood 
with their belt on their waist and their shoes on their feet and their staves in their hand because they were getting ready to leave Egypt suddenly. And this is one of the problems. So you, you read the rabbinic writings and you talk to some of the rabbis, even the messianic rabbis, and you never hear about the feast being prophetic shadow pictures of coming events. And even the messianic rabbis that I know, they never, they might talk about the feast being prophetic shadow pictures of coming events, but you'll never hear them talk about what that prophetic symbolism might be and what it might refer to. And we see that as a big problem. But if we take a look, it does seem clear that Yeshua may have or probably did eat the Last Supper in a very similar fashion to what we today call the Pesach Seder service. So, for example, in Matityahu, or Matthew, chapter 26, and verse 20, it tells us that when evening was come, Yeshua sat down with the twelve. So he wasn't standing, he was sitting with the twelve. And then in Matityahu, or Matthew, chapter 26, and verse 23, Yeshua answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me, referring to the dishes of sop, or dip. Then we come to John or Yohanan chapter 13 and verse 25. We see, and this is such an interesting thing because, uh, well, it says, leaning back on Yeshua's breast, Yohanan or John said to Yeshua, Adon, is it I? Am I the one who's going to betray you? And then again in Yohanan or John chapter 21 and verse 20, it says, Then Kepha or Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Yeshua loved, referring to Yohanan or John, following who had also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Adon, or Master, who is the one who betrays you? And so it's kind of funny when you, you see these uh, paintings, very famous paintings from the Middle Ages, and what you see is you see the disciples sitting at a modern European table, uh, very high up with chairs, and that wasn't how they sat back then. Typically the way that they would eat the Pesach in the first century and in Second Temple period times, is they had a very low slung table, perhaps you might say 12 to 18 inches off the ground, basically just enough to elevate the food and keep it out of the dirt. And then they would put down blankets or pillows or what have you, and then people would either sit up or they would lie down. And so typically they were, they were much, much lower to the ground. You didn't have these elevated or raised European style tables back in the first century. So you see these funny paintings where you have uh, the Apostle John is leaning over on Yeshua's breast. He's re resting his head here. It's just kind of like, just get off me. You know, it's just really, it's, uh, it's funny the difference in culture and cultural understanding. But back in the first century, the table was a very low slung table and they used blankets or pillows and they ate things uh, while sitting or leaning or reclining on the ground. And then in Matthew, Yahu or Matthew chapter 26, in verse 26, it tells us that as they were eating, Yeshua took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And so if you remember, we talked about Colossians chapter 2, start verses 16 and 17, and we said how the apostle Shaul tells us that the meat that we eat, including the bread and the drinks that we drink, are prophetic shadow pictures of coming events. This is where it comes to life, right here. In verse 27, Then Yeshua took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the renewed covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So can we understand the importance of why the Apostle Shaul is telling us we need to be letting only the body of Messiah tell us what are the foods we can eat, what are the ritual drinks that we should drink, because these things have tremendous importance and symbolism. Now, it's also often said that when a Jew reads the Renewed Covenant, it's as if he's reading a totally different book than what the Gentile is reading. And that's because a Jew is going to understand the first century, second temple period context that the Renewed Covenant was written from. Now, I'm going to pick on the New King James Version here because I use the New King James. So in Matthew, or Matit Yahu, chapter 26 and verse 30, it says that when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And that's kind of funny because it sort of gives us the idea that they sort of reached into the back of the pew and pulled out the hymnal and opened it up and picked a, song, picked a hymn and sang it. 
And that's not at all what happened because they didn't have that kind of a hymnal back in the first century. But what they did have is the Hallel Psalms. And when we read it in the Murdoch Peshitta Aramaic, again, we don't believe this is the original version, but there's a lot of good insights you can get from reading the Peshitta Aramaic. It says, and they sang praises, meaning psalms, and went forth to the Mount of Olives. And what we understand from this, any Jewish person will tell you that, at least traditionally, when you go to the Sabbath or the feasts or the new moon days, at least traditionally, the Jews would read from what are called the Hallel Psalms. And that's Psalms chapters 113 to chapters 118. And this is done at every Sabbath, every feast, and every new moon day, at least traditionally. So again, we see the Jewish context of this. Now another thing we need to understand about the context is that in the Second Temple period, it's believed that sometimes the rabbis or teachers would hold a graduation ceremony for their disciples the night before the Pesach. Now, since Yeshua was our rabbi, he's our one and only rabbi, there's only one, there will never be more than one, but since he was a rabbi, or at the very least our teacher, it's very possible that he was again following the second temple period tradition in this way, and that the Last Supper was a graduation ceremony for his disciples. But the thing we need to understand about that is because it wasn't the Pesach, the laws of the Pesach do not apply to it. Because it wasn't the Pesach, it was a graduation ceremony held the night before the Pesach in the manner of a Pesach Seder service. Now we also get into a large number of questions about the timing now, we believe in what's called a Semitic inspiration for the Renewed Covenant, and that's that we believe that the Renewed Covenant, or the New Testament, was originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic, or perhaps a combination of both, and some of the Church Fathers testify to that. Now, we no longer have the original manuscripts, and again, we believe that the Peshitta Aramaic is not the original. We explain that on the Nazarene Israel website. But if we've ever heard the saying that a lot gets lost in the translation, we're going to see that there's certain timing issues that really are a problem, at least in the English. And I'm going to mention these. I know that some people will watch this in languages other than English, but I also know that the King James Version was used as a base for other translations, and the King James was a very influential translation, so it has influenced some of the other translations. If you're watching in another language, then please uh, use what's specific to your language. But what we need to understand here is that there are some timing issues. The Last Supper was not the Pesach, and it couldn't possibly have been the Pesach because Yeshua was on the cross, or the stake if you prefer, or the tree, or the gallows, or whatever words you want to use there, Yeshua was being sacrificed on the day of the Pesach, meaning on the afternoon of the 14th. But the problem is that there's a number of mistranslation issues, particularly in English, particularly with regard to the synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are all patterned after each other. Now, the synoptic Gospels can be misread to say that the Last Supper was the Pesach, meaning it can be misread to say that the Last Supper was held on the afternoon of the 14th, and it wasn't. We all we know it's very simple, very simple concept. The Last Supper could not have been held on the afternoon of the 14th because that's when the Pesach was being sacrificed. So Yeshua was being sacrificed on the afternoon of the 14th. Therefore, the Last Supper could only have been the night before. And this is something that's very intuitive, very obvious to new readers. But then you read these other commentaries and people will be misunderstanding and misreading the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So these questions always come up when we talk about the Pesach. So we're going to talk about some of them here, and we'll talk about more. If you want to know all the details, then I encourage you to read the Torah calendar study with the chapter on the Pesach. We're also going to see that Scripture tells us that the Last Supper was eaten with leavened bread. Now that's impossible if the Last Supper was the Pesach. Because according to Scripture, all leaven and all leavened bread has to be destroyed prior to the Pesach. So the Pesach begins to be offered around 2.30 or 3 in the afternoon. 
between the evenings as the sun begins its descent, begins to come back down to earth. And at least the tradition, as it was shared with me and with many other people, is that leaven has to be destroyed by noon on the 14th. So you destroy the leaven at noon, and then by the time the sun begins to set, that's when you offer the Pesach. That's when Yeshua also was offered. Okay, let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at the evidence in Scripture. So in Matthew, Yahu, or Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26, it says, And as they were eating, Yeshua took artos, which is leavened bread. Okay, that's not unleavened bread. It's not matzah. Okay, it's leavened bread, artos. And he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And once again, let's think about Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, telling us when Yahweh gives us something we're supposed to eat, it's going to be symbolic of something important still to come. Colossians chapter 2 tells us there's future fulfillments that are still to come. So it's important we do things as Scripture says. So we take a look at this word artos. We look it up in Strong's New Testament or Greek concordance just to make sure we know what we're looking at. And it's Strong's New Testament or Greek 740. Artos. Now it's from New Testament 142 and it means a loaf of bread or leavened bread as in raised bread. That's going to correspond to the Hebrew lechem. Now we don't know if it was a hollow loaf or what it was. Uh, it doesn't say. But at least it was raised or leavened bread that Yeshua broke during the Last Supper, again proving it could not have been the day of the Pesach. It had to be the evening before. Let's take a look at this in the Peshitta Aramaic. We see the same thing, just using different language and different words. It says, And as they were eating, Yeshua took bread, and the word there in Aramaic is lechema, and blessed and break, and gave to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. So lechema is the Aramaic counterpart to the Hebrew word lechem, meaning leavened bread. Once again, it's not matzah, it's lechem or lechema. It's leavened bread. So it could not have been the day of the Pesach. had to be the evening before. Again, there's some more translation questions. So we come to Matthew, Yahu, or Matthew chapter 26 and verse 17. Again, I'm going to pick on the New King James Version. It says, Now, on the first day, that's wrongly translated, that's protos, on the first day, it's mistranslated, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yeshua, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Okay, well, if we look this up in the Greek, the word there is protos. Now, the word protos can mean first. Okay? You can legitimately translate the word protos to say, on the protos, or on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But the problem is, it cannot mean that in any kind of an understandable context. So, what it means is it means in front of, or before, or prior to. So we take a look in Strong's New Testament or Greek concordance because we want to make sure we got the right thing, we're doing the right thing. And it's Greek 4413, protos. It's a contracted superlative of Greek 4253, which we'll look at next. Foremost in time, place, order, importance. It's translated as before. So before the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Again, you can you can legitimately translate it as the first, but not in this context, not in this theological context. Now let's take a look at the root word to make sure again that what we're looking at, and that's Greek 4253. It's a primary position meaning for or before, that is in front of or prior to, meaning it's before the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, so that's a lot of technical detail, but it's very important technical detail because a lot of people have been taught the wrong thing on this subject. So let's take this, what we just learned, let's plug it back in to Matthew or Matthew Yahoo 26 and verse 17. This again, the New King James Version, but with a corrected understanding. It says, now protos, meaning before. So before the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, meaning the day before, 
the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The disciples came to Yeshua, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Pesach? So, meaning the Last Supper, because Yeshua was going to be on the tree, or the cross, or the stake, on the day of the Pesach, so this was his Pesach celebration. He's eating it the day before as a Pesach Seder, which we understand to be the Last Supper. Now, if we understand it in this way, everything reconciles with John. That's very important, because the synoptic accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they need to reconcile with John. So John, or Yohanan, chapter 13 and verse 1, tells us, now before, and the word there is pro. We already saw that word. We saw that protos, and then it refers to pro. It just simply means before. So everything reconciles. John 13, verse 1 says, now before, or pro, the feast of the Pesach, meaning the day before the feast of the Pesach, when Yeshua knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Well, that's good. But so then people have still more questions. That, okay, well, I understand how those reconcile, but now what about Luke or Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8? And these are some very important questions because uh, originally the translators of the King James Version, from which the New King James and many other translations are based, uh, they didn't have the understanding that Yeshua wasn't going to violate his father's Torah. So Yeshua said very clearly in the Beatitudes, one of the very first things he said is he says, do not think I came to destroy the Torah and the prophets, but that wasn't the understanding of a lot of the original translators, and that's not the understanding of most Christian translators either. So there's these questions that are hanging because of these translations. They've been wrongly translated, and again, much was lost in the translation. So we come to Luca or Luke, chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. It says, Then came, or then approached, the day of unleavened bread, when the Pesach must be killed. And Yeshua sent Kepha, meaning Peter and Yohanan or John, saying, Go and prepare the Pesach for us, that we may eat it. So people have questions about this. They say, well, whoa, 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 hold up. It says, then came the day of unleavened bread. And they think it means that it was the first day of unleavened bread. But that's not what it says. So if we come here to translate it into Hebrew, if we take then came or then approach the day of unleavened bread, if we were to translate that into Hebrew, it would probably read, ve'yavo hayom hamatzot, or something very similar to that. And you can also very legitimately translate that, then the day of unleavened bread approached, or then approached the day of unleavened bread. Meaning, the day of unleavened bread was the next day, but it was drawing nearer, it was approaching. So if we understand it this way, then we have the Last Supper being on the evening of the conjunction of the 13th and 14th of Aviv, not on the conjunction of the 14th and 15th of Aviv. And if we understand it that way, then we don't have Yeshua violating the Torah. And that's very, very important. So if we just simply understand that the word protos means before, just like the word pro means before, then the synoptic accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all reconcile with John as they should. And that puts the Last Supper the day before the Pesach. Very simple. If you want to see the details, I refer you to the Torah calendar study, the chapter on the Pesach. But let's take a look at some other questions that people commonly have and regarding typically bread. And if we take a look, we're going to see that the Apostle Shaul or Paul understood that the Pesach and the Last Supper were held on different days. And once again, we take a look at the form of bread that was eaten. It makes it very clear. So in 1 Corinthians, or Corinthian Aleph, chapter 5, starting in verse 7, the Apostle Shaul tells us, speaking about the Feast of the Pesach, he says, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. And the term there is adzumos. He says, For indeed, Mashiach, our Pesach, was sacrificed for us. So here we have, the term azumos, meaning unleavened, mentioned in the same context as the Pesach. That's theologically correct. 
he says, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread, adzumos, of sincerity and truth. So again, here we have the Apostle Shaul equating unleavened bread, adzumos, with the Pesach. Okay, so we take a look at this word. We look it up in Strong's Greek or New Testament concordance, just to make sure we got everything right. It's Strong's Greek or New Testament 106, adzumos. And it means just simply unleavened, meaning unleavened bread. That's what in Hebrew we would call matzah, or matzot for plural, but just simply unleavened bread. So now, by way of contrast, let's come to 1 Corinthians, or Corinthian Aleph, 11, starting in verse 23. And here the Apostle Shaul says, For I received from the Master that which I also delivered to you, that the Master Yeshua, on the same night in which he was betrayed, which is the night of the Last Supper, he, I mean, this is the night before the Pesach, he took artos, meaning leavened bread. So here we have an association of artos, or lechem, or lechema, meaning leavened bread with the Last Supper because it was the evening before the Pesach. Now let's notice something very interesting in verse 24. It says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And people are always trying to turn this into some new ritual observance. They're always trying to say Yeshua was instituting some new feast or some new tradition. Uh, the Catholic Church tries to take to, tries to turn this into the Eucharist. Uh, they've got little wafers floating around here and there. There's all kind of communion. People are always trying to turn this into something that it's not. And the thing is that we need to understand, again, this is in the same context of a Jew, when they read the Renewed Covenant, it's like they're reading a totally different book than what the Gentile is reading because the Gentile doesn't understand the Second Temple Jewish or Hebraic context of this thing. But if you spend any time at all around religious Jews or traditional Jews, basically they break bread and take wine anytime they get together. Anytime they have a gathering, whether it's a new moon day or a Sabbath day, and in most of the feasts. So they obviously they don't take leavened bread at the Pesach or in the days of unleavened bread because you're not supposed to have anything leavened during that time. They also don't take bread at Yom Kippur because that's part of their understanding is that Yom Kippur is observed by fasting. But this was not something new. This is something that traditional Jews have done, at least hypothetically, going all the way back to the days of Avraham when Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. So anytime religious Jews get together, they're celebrating the days of Avraham and Melchizedek bringing out bread and wine. That's all Yeshua was saying here. He's just saying, whenever you get together, whether it's a new moon day or a Sabbath or a feast day, and you're breaking bread and taking wine, do this in remembrance of me. Just like we talked about with Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Why is because these foods are symbolic of Yeshua. That's the symbolism here. And there's still future fulfillments, but that was the symbolism in the first century. Continuing in verse 25, it says, And in the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the renewed covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And again, He's not instituting a new communion wafer and a communion cup. And I had a Catholic priest try to convince me that, or he wasn't a priest, he, he, had, he was studying to be a priest. He tried to convince me that, that the wafer that they offer literally becomes Yeshua's body. That's some transubstantiation routine. And it's like, you, know, you, you, you do not understand the Hebrew context of what you're talking about. So that's all Yeshua was saying. Yeshua is like, uh, he is the living manna. He's the living bread. He's also what is symbol. So he's symbolized by the matzah. He's also symbolized by the lechem, by the artos, by the leaven bread. He says, for as often as you eat this, and in this context he uses leavened bread because it's the last supper. It's the evening before. And drink this cup. 
you proclaim the master's death until he comes. So it's very interesting because for the Last Supper, Shell is using the word artos, referring to a raised or a leavened loaf. Now what we need to understand here is the Last Supper does not institute a new ritual and the Last Supper does not alter the Pesach. And people are attempting to use the Last Supper to add things to the Pesach, to alter the Pesach, but it was not the Pesach. It was, it was perhaps we'd look at it as a graduation ceremony of a rabbi or a teacher with his students. Yeshua would not have done anything to change his father's Torah. He was very clear not to think that he had come to do that. And Yeshua was not, people are always trying to establish the Last Supper as an additional day of observance the day before the Pesach. We should not do that. Yeshua was not adding to his father's calendar. Yeshua was not establishing a new ritual ceremony on the conjunction of Aviv 13 and 14. And the reason we know that is that adding to the calendar is strictly prohibited in the Torah. Places like Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32, and in other places, we see we are not to add or take anything away from Yahweh's words. So again, this is just simply any spend time around religious Jews. Right? They get an excuse. They're breaking bread and taking wine. So Sabbath, new moon days, and most of the feast days, they're breaking bread and taking wine. That's what they're doing. That's what Yeshua was doing here. He's not adding anything to the calendar. Same thing with the ritual washing of the feet. You've got a lot of groups, a lot of people incorrectly teaching once again, that Yeshua is attempting to institute a new rite or a new ritual of washing feet the evening before the Pesach at the, at the time of the Last Supper, and they base this incorrectly on John chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. Uh, some churches even come up with a, a night to be much observed and all these kinds of things. No, <laughs> that does not exist. Yeshua did not change his father's Torah. He would have been a disobedient son. He was not a disobedient son. He did not break the Torah. We know, just simply, we know that Yeshua was the sinless, spotless lamb who kept the Torah perfectly. How could he break the Torah and keep the Torah perfectly? That makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. But here we go. Yohanan, or John, chapter 13, starting in verse 3. It says, Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from Elohim and went to Elohim, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Continuing in verse 14, he said, If I, then, your master and teacher, have washed your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And once again, people are trying to turn this into a new ritual observance, and it just does not work. You cannot have Yeshua keeping the Torah perfectly by breaking the Torah through adding new rites, rituals, days of worship, observances, and these kinds of things. All Yeshua was doing is he was saying, look, I'm your king. You know, I'm the one you're doing this all for. Okay? I'm serving you. That's how you need to grow my kingdom, is you need to serve other people. And through the humility and through the spirit, that's how my kingdom's going to grow. That's how I want you to serve me. And people are always trying to say, oh, no, 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 no. We, we don't have to do that. We just have to wash each other's feet once a year. So, no, 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 no. Or they're trying to take communion once a year. No, 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 no. That, that, that's not what Yeshua was doing. So once again, when a Jew reads the Renewed Covenant, he's, it's like he's reading a totally separate book because he's got a different context to this thing. Okay. So let's answer the questions that we posed at the beginning of this study. So if Yeshua, perhaps, probably, seems likely, ate the Last Supper as a Passover Seder service or in a manner similar to today's Passover Seder service, does that mean that we also should do the same thing today? And our feeling is that no, we should not do that because the Last Supper was not the Pesach. 
And Yeshua didn't add anything to his father's Torah. Yahweh commands us to keep his Torah in places like Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2 and Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32. He specifically commands us not to add anything and not to take anything away from his Torah. So Yahweh commanded the Pesach. He never commanded a night of the Last Supper. He never commanded a night to be much observed. He never commanded ritual foot washing or breaking bread or taking communion once a year or anything of the sort. He did not institute any new commandments. That, that He would just would not have done that. So now let's answer the other question that we posed at the start of this study, and that is, should we perhaps keep the Pesach today in the manner of Exodus 12? feasting in haste with our shoes on our feet our belt on our waist we've got our staff in our hand and we're ready to leave Egypt at a moment's notice is that how we're supposed to eat the Pesach today and our feeling is yes that's exactly that's absolutely how we're supposed to keep the Pesach today and I I want you to hear me on this especially uh, now even if you are let's say you're a believer in Yeshua and you're living in the land of Israel today What we need to remember is Yeshua didn't tell us to have a sit-down party. This isn't all about us. So Yeshua, rather, he gives us the Great Commission. So, And basically, he gave us the mission to go into the world and immerse disciples in his name. And in the first century, he gave his disciples the mission to go back out into the world and immerse disciples in all nations in his name and teach them to do everything that he said to do. And in context, we know that is to establish a single kingdom, which is a single ministry, it's the same thing, a single body of Messiah worldwide for him. That's what he wants us to do, and travel is involved in that. Take a look in Matthew Yahu, or Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 15. Yeshua says, Therefore, When you see the abomination of desolation, or the abomination that makes desolate, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the set-apart place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So what we need to understand here, again, and I say this with respect toward our Jewish brothers and sisters who are living in the land of Israel, Our mission right now is not to be in the land, specifically per se. Our mission, rather, specifically, is to go into all nations to build a global kingdom or to build a unified ministry for Yeshua. And yes, the land of Israel is one of those land, it is one of those nations where we need to go into and make disciples that do everything that he says to do, but one of the things he says to do is that we're going to end up needing to leave or to flee the Zionist land of Israel. And I say this with respect to our Jewish brothers and sisters, but we have other studies on the website. The term Zionism basically refers to those who believe that you can bring Israel back to the land without the Messiah. The concept of Zionism is that the people can serve as the Messiah, and that is an anti-Yeshua concept. So if you are a believer in Yeshua and you're dwelling in the land, you might want to pray about which takes priority, dwelling in the land or obeying your Messiah and King. And that's all I'm going to say, and I hope to say that with love and respect. But no matter where we're living, our mission is the Great Commission. Now, whether we're a Jew living in the land of Israel or whether we're an Ephraimite in the dispersion, or maybe we don't know what we are, we, we're not supposed to be rehearsing the Pesach right now by sitting down and resting under a Babylonian or Egyptian or Zionist democratic government. Because as we show in the study on Revelation in the end times, Babylon will fall. You could also say Egypt will fall. And we know for a fact that Zionism will fail because Zionism, again, has the concept that the people can serve as the Messiah. It's an anti-Yeshua concept. So wherever we're living, whatever we're doing, right now we need to be rehearsing leaving Egypt or leaving the world in the second exodus. Okay? So that means we still need to rehearse fleeing. If we're outside the land of Israel, 
we need to rehearse going back to the land of Israel. If we're inside the land of Israel, we need to rehearse fleeing the land of Israel when the abomination that makes desolate desolate is set up, and then coming back to the land of Israel in the second exodus. That's what we're supposed to be doing. If you'd like to know more about the details of the end times, I recommend you to study Revelation of the End Times, or you can check the series Revelation Simplified on our YouTube channel. But whoever we are, whatever we're doing, and we're going to talk about this more in the next section, we're supposed to be rehearsing leaving Egypt or the world system. So no matter who we are, no matter where we're living, yes, we have reasons to rehearse fleeing Egypt or the world system. Now, even if we need to flee the land of Israel when the abomination that makes desolate is set up, all of us who believe on Yeshua have the goal of going back home to the land of Israel in the second exodus, which comes after Armageddon. You can read about that in the study on Revelation of the End Times. And when we come home after the second exodus, that's when we're going to build Ezekiel's temple, or what's sometimes called the Millennial Temple. And that's when we're going to establish his true millennial government here on this earth. And at that time, he will be our head in the heavens, and we will be his body, serving as his hands and his feet, doing the things that he says to do as communicated by his spirit. So our conclusion is, yes, we should very much treat the Pesach as a dress rehearsal for fleeing the second exodus. And we're going to talk about this in the next section. However, as we're also going to see in the next section, we should not sacrifice a lamb today as it was in the days of Exodus 12 when there was no priesthood in Israel. And we'll talk about that in the next section. So thank you very much for joining us for our presentation on the Last Supper. I hope you'll please also join us again next week when we talk about how the body of Mashiach should celebrate the Melchizedekian Pesach today no matter whether we're living in the land of Israel or outside of it. Please join us. Shalom. Shalom.